right, so while we're in this mood, I mean, I've got quite a bit more we can discuss about the very serious theolo theological stuff. But I thought while we're in the mood, I have these bird cards. And um, so you were walking, if it weren't raining, and it was day, we'd walk into the woods, and you might pray and ask for help. And one of the things that I do with ask people to do is this simple exercise where you maybe you're preparing to go on a um, you know a journey where there might be some conflict right and so you might sit and say uh, you know great great spirit and just surround me with a, uh, a shield of uh, and you say white and then the light is is it really, there's a sign for light, but um, it's, like, wah. it's like this, this wah, that'd be light too, that's light. And then, uh, and then for turning of the earth, the turning of the earth, that would be like 24 hours and forever. So let's just do this for real because it's a good thing to do anyway. Um, so you say, you want to close your eyes if you wish and just take a breath and say, uh, great spirit, Surround me with a shield of white light that nothing can penetrate for the next uh, turning of the earth and forever. One time. So now you have a protection around you, which is one of the most important aspects, most practical aspects of the spiritual life, is to feel and to be uh, protected from accidents and, you know, just random things from, we say always, that, like there are bad spirits involved. Or whatever. So now that's protected, but in terms of going out to the woods, you might ask a question of, you know, spirit of Manitou and say, send me a sign. You know, you're going to we, uh, you know, uh, what was that? Um, hmm. It's not coming to me. Le, ki means a great wonderful sign that you're teaching me something and that's a word for a sign in the woods it could be birds could be animals could be clouds in the sky they're also all signs key gate only woken that's again several Algonquin languages have that word and so uh, we're out in, in the woods and you're walking along and a bird comes up maybe it's a hawk right maybe an eagle that's eagle and then uh, it has a sign, and part of the message is through the species. So you need to know all the species and all what every species has, you know, as its job. But of course, that's almost impossible. But we made these cards um, would have little English little cue signs on to remind you of what does that species means. So also, what I'll do is I'll do a little, you know, little mumbo jumbo over the cards here, right? Little blessing in the cards, love you, Niskan, love you, it's all the book of and I'll ask these bird spirits, who really are your ancestors in many ways, in Manitou, to come and to speak to you through the cards of the way that a bird would, but we're inside, because you're not going to see any birds coming in here, although that would be interesting. That would be fascinating. You know, so we're praying to Grandfather the Eagle, and I have a song, by the way, which I'll sing, um, which you may have heard. Yo ho yo Hyundai. Does anybody know that song? The stickers on the Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, the meaning of the song is uh, it's to the eagles, asking the eagles to bring you a message or to hear your message and to bring it to the spirit world up in the sky and then to come back later on with your answers with specific detailed information if necessary. You know, because it would be nice when we pray to actually get an answer, you know. Biscuit in the third, you know, whatever. It's like, it could be very valuable. So, anyway, the song goes like this <clears throat> Yo ho, yo ho, yo hande. Yo ho, ya ho, ya hande. Yo ho, ya ho, ya hande. Yo ho, ya ho, ya hande. Hey, music is caught up. I met a window, Pico I sing days, keep a Pico I sing days, keep a Bet you're gonna watch me oh, yeah. a Hyundai. Hey, Missy just caught up. I met a window, Pico I sing days, keep a Pico I sing days, keep a Bet you're gonna.
using that over and over and fade out. And this represents the eagle flying higher and higher until you can't see him anymore. Yo ho, yo ho, yo hunde. Yo ho, yo ho, yo hunde. Yo ho, yo ho, yo hunde. Yo ho, yo ho, yo Okay. So now we've wow. asked, this is our prayer. So your prayers can often be in the form of songs and dancing. Dancing is a very important part of prayer. So, not that we do enough, but remember that. So, we do this, and then you're connected to the bird spirit that is offering to help you to answer your questions. And so then, what I'll do is I'll mix these up a little bit and shuffle the bird cards. And each one is of a different species of bird. And what I'll do is, um, when you pick the card, it's as if that bird has come to you. Now, it might come to you for various reasons. It might come to you to show you where you are on your path in life right now. And of course, then I can look at that and tell all about you and all your secrets, and I'll <laughs> put them on camera for you. And, <laughs> or, you laugh now. <laughs> But another thing is can warn you of what it is that you should or could be or are aware of in terms of, you know, dangers that you need to address. So it's a matter of interpretation. But usually when a bird comes to you, there's often behavior involved, like a hawk might try to get its shadow to cross you, and that's actually, you know, really trying to get your attention, that there's something you need to be aware of, and that they're going, you know, you know, they're warning you. So. Hawks can warn you. Crows can warn you. In the same way, they have you know different numbers of cause mm -hmm. and different things. But what I'll do is I'm going to splay these cards like a fantail here, you know, and I'm going to hold them in front of you, and you pick one. And of course, you have to return it at the end of the, the game, right? And so this is somewhat, uh, somewhat how you say, uh, incomplete in that way, in that. These birds aren't going to actually dance around you or yell at you or whatever, but the species of the bird is probably half of the message. And so we'll do our best. So let me go and what did you get? Oh, um, very appropriate, I think. Okay. Especially seeing where I'm from. The hermit thrush? <laughs> yeah. Where are you from? Vermont. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Do you sing? Yeah, some. Uh huh. So are your. Um, you sing like folk songs and anonymous songs? Yeah, why not? Sure. Okay. Well, you know, the hermit thrush has a story. You know, the story of the hermit thrush is that there was a contest, you know, none of the birds could sing. And um, so there was a flying contest. The creator said, okay, I've got a bunch of songs here and it's time to hand them out, but I want you to have, go into a contest where every bird will compete to see who can fly the highest. And the one who highs, flies the highest will get the prettiest song. And vice versa. You ever heard this song? Yeah, the story, I mean. So, so, so the hermit thrush is a very small bird, and he was very nervous. And so he could hardly sleep the night before. He was just tossing and turning, you know. So finally, morning comes, 9 a.m., they're all there. 9 a.m., just like, <laughs> like here. And they're lined up on the bench, right? And so the hermit thrush is falling asleep because he didn't get any sleep. So there's this big eagle. He looks very strong. He's got all this, you know, fluffy leaves, uh, the wings, the feathers, so... He crawls up into the rough of this golden eagle. Ah. Golden eagle flies the highest, right? So he gets right in there and he falls right to sleep. And next thing he knows, he's way up in the sky and it's getting cold and windy. And he looks around and he's like, you know, half a mile in the air. And the eagle's like, what's wrong with me today? I just can't seem to get higher. It's just like there's this weight on my right shoulder here. I just oh, I can't get up. So he couldn't get very high and he goes back down. And then he jumps off, you know, then the bird, the little hermit thrush jumps off, you know. And so they all get their songs, and so the creator says, well, the highest flyer was actually the hermit thrush, because when he jumped off the eagle, he got surprised and went up in the air and went actually higher than the golden eagle. So the best song goes to the hermit thrush. <laughs> so he's the best singer. And the eagle, well, you don't get anything, because, you know, you get this, like, eh, kind of song, because yeah. you really didn't do much, you know. <laughs> the geezel, that's the one for eagle. Doesn't that have something to do with call? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Just call, unmelodious call, I guess. That's right. Right. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, it's like yeah, the unmelodious call. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they've been terrible sounding yeah, call. Yeah. But uh, Hawk's not bad, but Eagle's just yeah. Yeah. like come on. Yeah. So so that's the story of how the Eagle got the song. But the thing is the Eagle got no song because of that. But the Hermit Thrush got a great song, but he always felt yeah. guilty because he knew that he had basically cheated unwittingly. And so all the animals were and the birds were, you know, kind of angry at Hermit Thrush mm -hmm. for what happened. And then nobody could talk about it, you know. So it's embarrassing. So the hermit thrush has a certain amount of shame. And so the hermit thrush hides in the bushes, yeah. way up in the middle of nowhere, but can sing really, really well. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. So do you live in a remote area? It's true. Kind of, yeah. Uh, like in the woods? Right on the edge. Right on the edge, yeah. yeah. Just like the hermit thrush, right on the edge. Yeah, okay. right. So it fits, okay. So um, they tend to be able to be invisible at times. And at times, the hermit thrush can live a kind of a monastic life and just mm -hmm. be very oh, spiritual. Definitely me. <laughs> so, so that's you. The first to sing in the morning and the last at night to be singing. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that fits in. The, then that bird is truly a wabadaki because they're the people of the first light. Yeah. And so oh. that hermit thrush is one of our mm -hmm. birds because it sings up the sun. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that whole story about how we sing up the sun in the morning. We are the people in the east, and we sing up the sun, and then we pass it along behind us to the people behind us, and they just carry the sun along all across Turtle Island. But if we don't do our job, it's going to be a mess. <laughs> so we're really important to bring up the sun in the morning. And remind me, I have a lot of stories about that, because I'm Micmac, you know, and we're right there with Wabanaki bringing up the sun, you know. And then these scientists came to us, and the anthropologists, and they said, so you bring up the sun in the morning with your songs? You really believe that? I said, oh, yes. So, well, did you ever try it the other way? And we said, what do you mean the other way? What other way is there? Well, did you ever try not singing up the sun? No. Yeah, we'd have crazy. Message. <laughs> yeah, we'd have a you know, message would happen if the sun didn't come up. You know, that'd be terrible. You want to risk the life of the planet for a single experiment? That's nuts. You people get out of here. So that's why we still sing up the sun every morning, because we don't want to try the other way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so here we are in Wabanaki territory. We're bringing up the sun in the morning. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And the hermit <laughs> thrush is there with us. And we say that the birds pray for us. And they look to the sun coming up and they say they're, they're all their little choruses of songs are a prayer in the morning for the sun to come up. Mm -hmm. And it's all a prayer of gratitude, by the way. So, the hermit thrush. So you're one of us. Good. Okay. All right. So, what did you get? Not have. Well, you were a woman of faith. You you believe in the natural processes and you trust in faith that everything's going to turn out, All right? And uh, you believe in miracles. Okay. Well, that's nuthatch is famous for that. Okay. And the nuthatch is a very keen observer. Always enjoys watching everybody. And turns his head, looking at everything. But it also can come down the tree head first, like the squirrel. You know, so it comes down, but his head's still sticking out. So that means it's got some moxie to it. So, <laughs> so we, but mainly, no, no. yeah. Then the hermit thrush. Excuse me, the nuthatch. The nuthatch is a bird of faith, and is also a healing bird. And uh, I've collected some stories about the nuthatch. My sister is a big fan of the nuthatch. But have you ever accidentally healed anybody? She's a nurse. She's a nurse. She's a well, I hope it's more than accidental. Yeah. <laughs> but that's perfect. For, for a nurse to be a nuthatch means you're in the, absolutely the right business. Because my sister, who is even closer to birds than I am, um, you know, she had this pain in her chest up here, a very sharp pain. And she was very worried. She was outside, and she was looking at this spot. This is way up in Canada. The sun coming up, and she felt this terrible pain. And this nuthatch came out of nowhere, and and flew right into that spot and hit her with the butt of his head really hard and bounced off and the pain went away and never came back. Oh, wow. so that's just one story about the nuthatch. There's many, many amazing stories. They're miraculous birds. Cool. And so always look to the nuthatch for like, um, you know, if you need help and healing, they're, they just live in a realm of miracles. And also, I mean, they're common, you know, they're around. They're not very egotistical birds. They're very humble. You know, they look like little toys, you know. Yeah. But they are powerful healers. So if you got the nut hatch and you're a healer, then you're exactly the right mm -hmm. space in life, and we don't have to worry about it. 
She saved my cousin's husband's life. Oh, wow. Okay. So there, I'll tell you another story about it, not that. Um, there was, uh, you know, hummingbirds are so nervous, right? And they hate to be in captivity ever, right? Mm -hmm. So this woman who I know who's involved in Native teachings, but she was in her apartment and this hummingbird came in and was trying to get out and beating his head against a plate glass window. And, would, and so the owner of the house opened the door and was kind of brushing, trying to brush the hummingbird out with a broom out the door, but it wouldn't go. He didn't have any confidence in that person at all. Kept banging into the window, it was probably going to die. And then you know, the nuthatches are almost like the ministers of the, of the bird world. They're like, oh, I will help you. Come to me, you know. <laughs> oh, and so this nuthatch appeared on the other side of the plate glass window and started trying to get the eyes of the hummingbird, you know. And it's two very different species. And like, be calm, take a breath. <laughs> and my, this is my, actually, I think it was my sister who tells this story. And she's looking at the nuthatch, and the eyes are connecting. They're looking at each other, and finally the hummingbird, oh, okay, oh, and the hummingbird, and somehow they're. It looks like telepathy, and there's like something going on. And the, the hummingbird suddenly goes like this, and then heads out the doorway. And apparently the nuthatch went around and met the hummingbird, and they went up together. Yeah. So, you know, this is first-hand observation, not from me, but from second-hand for me. But, but anyway, nuthatches, you keep your eye on the birds, and they will show you stuff and how to heal people. A lot of it's psychological. This is a harrier falcon. Ooh. Oh, wow. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. No, my, my father was a harrier falcon. I know it sounds funny. My father was a harrier falcon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're, just, we're descended from squirrels anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> my mother's side. We're descended from squirrels. Um, so the falcon, falcons are halfway between owls and hawks, so and if you never could make up your mind as to whether you like owls or hawks better, now it's, you know you have your answer is that you're a, really a harrier falcon, which is a mixture. It has part owl and part hawk. So uh, one thing about all the harrier falcons is they tend to be quiet, and they listen more than mm. they speak. I don't know, but uh, that's my experience. So they listen really well because they're really big ears, and they're very secretive. And in the bird sanctuaries you go to, if they have a harrier falcon, they generally put up a big uh, sheet of um, wood so that when people come to look at the harrier falcon, you can hide. So they don't want people looking at them all the time. It's like... So that describes the younger me. Aha, okay. Well, but younger not me. so much the today me, so it's yeah. very interesting. Aha, uh -huh. okay, all right, that's fair. So they're uh, keen observers, and um, they are... Like I say, there's association with the supernatural that they're very helpful births. They help other people, but sometimes it's not obvious how they're helping because they like to do things kind of behind the scenes. That would be true. But they observe keenly over large areas. Sometimes a harrier will cover a large area all by themselves and they watch everything. And they, you know, keep track. That's you, right? Yeah, that's true. Okay, and in terms of nesting, I don't know if they weave baskets or. <laughs> that would be interesting if that were true. I think it is, I mean, but we'll find out. They actually they make nests on the on the ground level, like just a foot above the ground maybe, or on the ground, which is very unusual, mm -hmm. and in bushes and whatnot. Mm. So that's what's different about them. Mm. Okay, so they make their little mm. nests. Mm. So what did you get? Thank you. Wood duck. Wood duck. Mm. Okay, and <coughs> wood duck has a dark green. On the shoulders and the head, right? So I think that's interesting, and uh, so that's part of it. So not, the wood ducks, you know, swim in the water, and the water has to do with the heart and the direction of the wet with, with the things that like songs and emotions and family. And so the wood duck is an emotional healer. Have you ever worked in the area of. I was a mental health clinician. Oh, there you go. See, that's it. So, <laughs> and when you're doing, a mental health clinician, works a lot with emotions, right? I, and so you must be fairly comfortable in that realm, whereas some would not. Actually, I went into it to try to get comfortable in that oh, realm. Oh, well, you must have gotten yeah. better. I was really good, good with elders, particularly. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, the wood duck has uh, a lot of rituals. So you do you like doing ritual and ceremony? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's another aspect. The spirit world gives me rituals. 
Yeah, you agree in rituals. Yeah. yeah, so that's the wood duck. Because they are the ones where a lot of human rituals are actually taken from the wood duck. And from the other, like the mallards and their relatives. You know that relationships, a lot about relationships. So you know, ever been to a wedding where the male will take a piece of cake and stuff it in the mouth of yeah. the woman he's supposed to marry? Well, that's from the ducks. The ducks do that. They take a piece of food and they stick it right in the mouth of the female. And that's supposed to impress them that they're going to be able to provide, but that's what the, the ritual is about. Yeah, good. You know, so yeah. a lot of ritual, and a lot of it has to do with courtship and relationships. So, uh, so that's why I say skill in mating. You know, it's more like the skill of you know getting Connection. to know the families and make sure everybody's happy and and making the opposite sex feel comfortable and all that. So that's what I mean by that. And so it's living in the emotional realm. And also, a wood duck has a motherly aspect to it, a grandmotherly aspect. So, anything else you relate to with wood ducks for yourself? Is it well, I think of the water, of <clears throat> the layers, the depths. Yeah. In terms of learning and developing a strong eye, that, I mm -hmm. kind of connect that with water. Mm hmm. Okay. All right. That sounds good. I'm going to leave it at that. Okay. If anything else comes, I'll let you know. The Medahila. Uh -huh. the, the spirit lore. The what? The spirit core, Medahila. Medahila. Yeah, Meda is spirit and Hila mm -hmm. means gull. Gull. The loon. Mm -hmm. Medahila. Remind me of that later. Well, the loon is, of course, you know, Canadian symbol, but also has this dual meaning of the clown and, and the mourning. It's like the tragic clown. And goofing off a go, you know. <laughs> and there's a place in Maine that I go once in a while, it's on yeah. the lake. And at 3 a.m., this I hear this loud, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. you know, like yeah. real loud noise. I, I got loons on a lake. Uh, I got uh, 50 feet of lake frontage in Woodbury, and I hear the loons all the time. I like hearing them. They're wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I enjoy hearing them. Mm -hmm. I'm not that close to the water like other places on the lake. Uh huh. But they can be loud. So they have that laughter, so yeah. that people think of them as clowns. But also, there's this mournful aspect to the call, it sounds very sad. Yeah, yeah. So there's a story about a mother loon, you know, the little babies ride on the back, right? Yeah, yeah. And in the story, they fall off, which never happens, but, yeah. you know, when they drown, which would never happen. But the story is that she mourns for the lost uh -huh. little babies that fell off. Uh -huh. You know the loon song? Well, the, the main loon song goes like this. Uh -huh. Yo ho, yo ho, yo ho, ho, way hey ya hey ya hey yo, way hey ya hey ya hey yo, way hey ya hey ya hey yo, way hey ya hey ya hey yo. We can all sing that like this. Yo ho. So that's for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's a it loon is. call. Oh, oh, yeah. That's the part. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can do that on my flute, but not today. Okay, let's go. And she, okay. Perfect. Red headed woodpecker. So, um, yeah, and the woodpecker has a laughter too. It really goes, <laughs> like that. Yeah. 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 Yeah
like that. <laughs> like Woody. Woody, Woody, Woody. Like Woody. Be, I've heard that it. That would be affiliated. Yeah. <laughs> well, it would be, yeah. But, but that's okay. Let's mush them all together for me. <laughs> But the Pileated has that song. They're like dinosaurs, too. Mm -hmm. And then I have literally heard them laugh like that. So mm -hmm. I know it's not just a Woody. So now you know about Woody Woodpecker. That's really a ripping off the signature call of the mating call of a, of a Pileated Woodpecker who goes... <laughs> just about, yeah. Yeah. And they have other... Yeah. So, so anyway, in terms of this, um, you, uh, it provides shelter for others. And I feel that that, in a way, you... You nurture others in a kind of a sheltering way. You like take people under your wing, and you know, are you have you ever like helped to build a house? By the way, <laughs> right now. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> tell us about that. Well, we we have a place on a lake, and uh, we knocked the old place down, and we retired, and we're building a year-round forever home right now. Oh, wow. I left my husband doing it to come to this. <laughs> well, don't leave him permanently out there. No, I'll, I'll go back. Go, go back. Because I really like the lake. No. <laughs> oh, yeah. The husband's in that chair. No, we'll just have a talk with Paul. This is going on TV, you know. So. Yeah. Hi. He'll laugh. Hi there. Anyway, so isn't that a coincidence? You pick yeah. the woodpecker who gives you that energy to knock down houses and build other houses, which is what they do. You know, they can destroy a whole tree, but they yeah. can also build several different nests for other birds. Mm -hmm. And maybe they start on one and they say, eh, you know, I don't, I don't like this one. Go to another one, but then other birds can live in those houses. So they make lots of houses. And they're also, by the way, and you, you're good at laughter, right? Everybody agree she's a good yes, laugher? Yeah. <laughs> That's definitely the woodpecker thing. Yeah. But again, they have that laugh, just like in the cartoon. But the main thing is, have you ever um, done any work where you do any editing or any proofing or any, how you say, uh, troubleshooting? Grading mm -hmm. papers? Do you ever, are you a school teacher? No, I, I'm an, I was an art teacher. Okay. That's a teacher? Yeah, well, I didn't really grade much. Of, I was an art teacher. <laughs> okay, so you're like art teacher. Right? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, okay. Okay, so what the Whitbacker does is looks for um, and evaluates a, a stump for worms yeah, okay. or bugs. Okay, so it's going through and looking for bugs. And, you know, if there's something wrong, he'll, or she, will tell others, okay, look, you know. Well, or they'll I'll just evaluate eat the bugs. artwork with the kids and help well, them. There we go. So that's the woodpecker energy. Mm -hmm. So I think you got three out of three, right? I think I did. <laughs> that's pretty good. Cool. So it's literally building shelter, as we speak, and tearing down others. That is so woodpeckery. And by the way, one sign I forgot is very important it's on camera. That, and I mentioned this to somebody, but this sign, right? Right, you see this still, right? Yeah. It's not dead yet, right? <laughs> this is actually a dead American hand sign. Remember I said the other day that this was peace, right? Mm. But during the War of 1812, the Algonquins and the Iroquois were finally getting along for 10 seconds. And so they're in the trenches and the Haudenosaunee warriors show them this sign. And this is a sign for the Tree of Peace that, again, was planted right. the peacemaker they're going to leave it. So this is that sign that's been passed down from the Algonquin side until the 1960s when, uh, in Medicine Story, one of our locals, at that time still young, still alive somewhere, um, passed this on to these people that wanted to follow the Seven Fires prophecies and to become like a tribe, you know, so they could, you know, a rainbow tribe of different colors. And said, oh, well, then use this. This means the tree of peace. And so they forgot the tree part. And that became a symbol for peace. Okay, so then, you know, it's kind of overused maybe, but it's still our sign. And don't ever give it up. Don't say, oh, well, it's been corrupted. That's our sign. We got it from the Haudenosaunee during the War of 1812. And there you go. Ah, okay. uh -huh. So that's peace. Cool. Peace. Oh. Tree of peace. Tree of peace. Oh. Peace is actually like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So who has a card? You have a card. Yes. Okay, and it's, it's the sparrow. Okay, sparrow is a symbol of humility. I think we can all agree. It's the mm -hmm. paragon of humility, right? Mm -hmm. Community, absolutely, right? Yeah. And freedom. So you like to think in terms of being, having freedom. So that's I you. Do. You're yes. the sparrow. Yes. So tell us more.
What do you mean? Well, in terms of community, let's. I mean, you know, it's kind of ironic to ask somebody to brag about how humble they are, but. <laughs> I can attest to that. <laughs> will, you, will you speak up for her? Well, I, I can't on the humble part. Yeah, okay, so. Um, because we're actually co workers. Okay, so she's. She's. Deadly. Are you okay if I talk about you a little bit? <laughs> but definitely the person who I would say holds the department together. Mm -hmm. is the go-between between all of the IOA physicians and all of those of us who are providers. Mm -hmm. She's the one that answers the call and everything else. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be sent out of attention. Mm -mm. Um, mm -hmm. And I have learned if I want to say thank you or say anything in appreciation to do it quietly. Mm -hmm. um, that you don't want mm -hmm. the public recognition either. Mm -hmm. But you're also often saying and really concerned that if you've said something um, was that the right time? Was that the right place? Yes. I hope I didn't. You're very, very sensitive and not wanting to offend anyone. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. And in terms of community, how would you describe your efforts towards community building? Well, I, my degree is social work, so I did social work in the community for like almost 15 years for in Shenandoah County. That counts. And um, I've done like conflict resolution. I've done motivational. Um, interviewing um, and uh, I it, it sort of it goes hand in hand for me with the freedom aspect is that um, and I also don't judge people um, and I it's sort of to all mismatched in there for me um, because it's very important for me that not only for me to be free, but that others can also live their lives freely. <laughs> this is the great horned owl. Oh. Can we get a close up on this. It's the dead ringer. <laughs> this is great horned owl. Okay, so this is. You know, great bird, right? And there's one, there's a barred owl down the street that I don't know if you get along and you horn owls and barred owls, but <clears throat> but the horn, the great horned owl is the one that goes, woo, woo, you know, your standard. And uh, so there's that question, woo. And they're also very intuitive. They're attached to the spirit world and dreaming. And of course, you know, they're often associated with the dark side, uh, nighttime, and the moon, in relation to the moon. And we have a nice moon out. Also, the subconscious and their wings are the quietest of wings. That then, when they flap their wings, you can't hear them. <laughs> and so, this would be very useful in the realm of, say, uh, crime detection or something. But um, you know, they're very quiet, very quiet, and very intuitive. But they're associated with dreams and the dream world. Now, you know, also that owls are associated with death, and it's not that they kill people; it's that they are uh, anything that has to do with death, they're the experts. It's not that they kill anybody, okay? Because that's false. The only time that an owl would be involved in the death of the person that way is if there, again, there was a sorcerer involved. A sorcerer is using the owl, and often unsuccessfully, but it scares people. Our native people are often scared of owls. But in fact, the owls is often involved in communicating to the deceased of someone who has died. Have you ever done that? I was a death investigator for the last 10 years. Wow. <laughs> so. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's what an owl is. Yeah. It, it is, a death investigator. I wrote a whole book about that, or a big chunk of my book, Bird Medicine. The biggest section is about owls reporting deaths to their loved ones. Huh? Yeah, about to do that too. Uh -huh. Be, you know, give uh, death notifications. Uh -huh. Contact people to say, you know, your estranged brother or family member mm -hmm. has died, and this is what caused it. So yeah, yeah. so you're you're comfortable in that realm, right? I yeah. mean, you're something you can do, right? Yep. Wow. So that's yeah, that's amazing. I mean, that is a million to one. Really, I think. Yeah. I don't think I've ever met a death investigator. Oh, <laughs> you have now. And uh, now, <laughs> hey, and. Uh, Got the card. Got the card to it. Yeah, it looks good resemblance. So, Use it so, in my ID. Also. <laughs> well, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. Sorry, I can't do that. But, and, okay, there's four gatekeeper birds, by the way. And the golden eagle is the gatekeeper of the north of the bird wheel, which is in the south. Don't be confused. And then the east is the hawk, and that's the gatekeeper of the east. 
and very powerful because he has the red tail hawk. He has that red color associated with the east. And the gateway of the east is, you know, life. And why are we here? So when we pray to the east, we're praying for questions about why we're here and where our mission is life in life is and what it is we have left to do on this earth to complete that mission. It's very important. And we turn to the south and we have the crow. Nobody got the crows or ravens today. But the crow or the raven is a storyteller and he's the gatekeeper of the south. And so that has to do with information and, and learning, and you know, they're very smart and all that. But the West is the gatekeeper of the West, is the owl. So these are the power birds. These four birds are special in Eastern Algonquin lore. And again, some areas people have lost this, but I have found scattered you know, wisdom keepers of various Algonquin tribes, uh, nations across the eastern half of the country who have exactly the same story. It has never been published until moi <laughs> spilled beans. But before there was any publication, all these people are in total agreement all across the country. So it's something very special. Now the eagle in the north is gatekeeper in the north, hawk in the, west, in the east from the south, and the owl in the west. And even Hawaii, they agree with that. Mm -hmm. They have a special kind of white owl that they do ceremony for, and uh, that is the gatekeeper of the West for them too. And of course, with the West is where the sun goes to die, so there's this association with that. And I have zillions of stories about the owl being reported of death, but the most important one was my Aunt Helen, my great Aunt Helen, you know, that taught me about birds and taught me about herbs and everything. And uh, she was part of the Mary Mishi, you know, that split off tribe of Micmacs. And uh, she was very powerful with birds, and she could just you know, she would tell a bird, go over there, and it would, and like, it's anywhere, you know, or come here, and they'd come. And uh, she'd get messages from them, and there was a white owl in her yard, which she shared with this blind woman. And the blind woman was married, and she moved five, five miles away to the beach. She lived on the beach, you know, from that time on. And so occasionally they'd call on the phone, because they were best friends. Blind Holland was in her 90s, you know. And just was really good with birds. So uh, one day, the uh, uh, the same white owl came to the window of the blind woman in her kitchen, which is on the second floor, kind of hidden away. This little window. The owl goes to that window and starts banging on the window, and you know, even screeching. And so she's in the kitchen. She goes over. And she has to put her face right up against the glass, and she can see from about two inches away. And she sees that owl, the owl sees her. And the owl, she claims, gave her a telepathic message that my Aunt Helen had died, who was her neighbor. Because they shared the owl. The owl lived in the tree right on the border between the two yards. And they would talk about it all the time. Um, oh, how do you see that? Did you hear that owl yesterday? Yeah, you know. So finally, this owl comes to her window, banging on the window. She said she realizes that Aunt Helen is dead. So she calls to her husband, and she said, this owl just came and told me that Aunt Helen is dead. That wasn't her. Everybody called her Aunt Helen, but, you know, Helen died. And so her husband says, oh, well, wait for the phone call. You know, you never know. So the phone rang right away, and it was a message that Aunt Helen had died. Mm -hmm. So that's just so typical of how the owls work. They didn't kill anybody. They were just there, man, had some sad news. You know, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. And so they, uh, that's how she learned about Aunt Helen. You know, but in my, my book, Bird Medicine, I have probably eight stories about owls doing that because each one is more amazing than the next. Mm -hmm. So I'd say you're really well suited for your job. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so it's a powerful position. So, looking at this man that I know well, he is a, uh, a fireman. If you know what a fireman is, he takes care of all the fire ceremonies for the whole village. And this oh, is way up. Fire keeper. He's a fire keeper. Yeah. You can call him that too. Mm -hmm. And uh, way up north in Canada, <clears throat> remote area. And so he did the fire uh, for all our ceremonies. And then we had this group of women who came in who wanted to do a secret ceremony. And they wanted to feel protected, but they were strictly women. And no man could know anything about them, you know. So they got our firekeeper, who was quite macho in his own way, to be the fireman by the lake. And they went up on the mountain in their secret, and they did all these secret ceremonies, you know. And while he's down there, he's keeping the fire for whatever, how many days, you know. 
and this, these loons keep coming right at him, you know, and right circling around him. And he said, I've never seen anything like it. And finally, it's just like, this is too strange, you know. So he goes up and he sees the head woman, the grandmother of the group coming down. She says, he says, some words went up like, I keep having these loons visit, you know, and, and why are you guys here? And who are you? He says, well, we're the loon clan. <laughs> and, and she says, I'm the grandmother of the loon clan. And we're doing special ceremonies this week for the loons. And he says, well, thanks for telling me. Because <laughs> they were like dying bombing him. You know? So anyway, that's a serious question here. Okay. Um, and of course, you know, this is part of the, I mean, it's fun, but it's part of the spiritual teaching. Okay. So what did you learn about spiritualness, whatever that means from this? Anything? I think for me. Oracular work. Uh, there's lots of kinds of it, and I have all kinds of different, totally different ways that I show people that our ancestors would be able to divinate. You know, there's shells, you know, you can even use dice, there's all kinds of, you know, there's... I use divining rods. Divining rods? Yeah. Okay, but often what it shows you, it's just like dream interpretation. Dreams rarely tell you right from wrong. Right. Dreams often describe to you clearly what you may be fuzzy about. Right. And you may not be able to tell what's more important, what's less important in your life sometimes. But a dream really makes it clear, but it doesn't make your choices for you necessarily. But it gives you a picture of this is what you are. And I also use, as divination, use a, a dictionary, which is kind of better than the Bible, in my opinion, because right. it's neutral. But it describes what it is I'm going through. And sometimes I don't know what I'm going through or why, and then I'll read I'll open a random dictionary or use the bird cards or a number of different things. I mean, people use tarot cards the same way. It doesn't always tell you what to do. It describes your situation and then you say, oh, well, I know what to do. You know, so this card, this bird is saying basically with all of you that you're all on the right track. Right. Nobody got, a, you know, a bozo card, you know. Uh, you're all pretty. But, you're all pretty much tuned into what you should be doing. So I often have. To so how does it? How do you think that works? How do we get these? How is it possible that all of you got birds that were pretty much describing where you are right now? I think the prayer that we did, calling on spirits to help us and protect mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. They're helping us and showing us what what we are right now. Mm -hmm. So they guided our hands when we chose. The cards. Mm -hmm. I believe that. I believe that's how it works. But also in a lot of this research I've done with living birds and how living birds come to people at just the right moment and describe something and tell them sometimes what to do, um, there seems to be an ancestral connection that it has to do with something or someone, literally a person, often seems to be working through that bird because sometimes the bird will make suggestions or hints of things that only they know or a family member would know. Mm. And so that, I've come to the conclusion that sometimes there's ancestors involved. And so in order to, and I was puzzled by that, I wasn't expecting that, so I went to various experts on shamanism and I said, um, you know, do you have any reportage of medicine men or women that will confess that they actually ride inside of birds? You know, that's what the question. So, um, as this, uh, what's his name? Not when it's the other guy. Um, a professor of shamanism at um, Brookhaven University, right? This famous professor focusing on shamanism and just of all kinds. So, I, I called him up. I said, I really need to know this question. I need to know if there's anyone who has ever literally said that they ride inside of birds and look around and tell what's going on and then give messages to people. He says, you know, he's calling him, I'm talking to him in San Francisco. He says, meet me tomorrow in Times Square. <laughs> you know, we're a red carnation, you know, so I'll know you, whatever. So, um, and so I said, really? He said, yeah, in a basement. He gives me the address. He said, go down in the basement and I'll be there at noon. You know, weird, of course, it's all weird. So I go down there, not knowing what to expect. I mean, it's a long trip to Times Square, right? Yeah. But hey, Times Square is a fun place. So I go and I go down these stairs, and it's in the theater district, you know? And there's this little party that's just started, and he's there, you know, just flew in from San Francisco. And I'm talking to him, finally get to him, because everybody wants to talk to him, he's a very famous person, right? 
And uh, so I said, oh, I'm Evan Pritchard. Oh, yeah, sure, I read your books, you know. And I said, so the question is, can you give me evidence that shaman, you know, these elders ride around in birds? And uh, he said, the person with your answer is, is standing next to you. And there was this, you know, woman, it was a somewhat white looking woman, I didn't know, but, you know, she was standing there and we talked already, I guess. I said, that's the person you talked to. I said, so you, what do you know about shamans riding around in birch? You know, and uh, she said, I was Rolling Thunder's assistant for 30 years. Do you have any questions? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, yeah. I did. And I said, did he ever say that, literally say that he went riding around in her eagles and hawks and things? Every morning. He said, every morning we'd get up early and he would discourse. He would download all the information he'd learned all night from flying around in birds. And he was very open about it. We'd ask questions. You know, he'd tell us all he saw. And then he taught us to do the same thing. And then after a while, he says, we got tired of that, so he went, to, he went direct. I said, oh, wow, what do you mean, went direct? Well, you know what it means to go direct. I'm like, OK, what does it mean? Well, no birds. You forget the bird. You just, just go direct. Yeah, okay. And you fly in your spirit. You go see and everything. So I thought, OK, well, this isn't convincing enough. I need something. <laughs> anyway, that was pretty good, right? <laughs> 24 hours, he got me talking to Rolling Thunder's assistant. <laughs> that was pretty good. And then, um, so I was thinking, and Brandy Spurs said, so, so what's, you know, I want more than this. I, this is really out there. So I want to know the, you know, more than one source of information. And I suddenly realized this face came to me of this person I know who's a spiritual, you know, person, works as a psychic, who grew up with Aboriginal Australians. I said, I'll call her. So I called her up and I said, well, what do you uh, think about this question? You your Aboriginal ancestors there, your, you know, your Australians, did they ever like tell you they're flying around in birds and crazy and stuff like that? She said, oh yeah, every morning they got up and tell me what, <laughs> what they'd seen. And then they taught me, I said, they taught you? She said, yeah, well, I was living in Australia as a young girl and was practicing this outback stuff. And I had this continual dream that I was an eagle flying across the United States. Well, I'd never been to the United States, but I was looking down and I was seeing Cleveland and Detroit, you know, and uh, Albany, Buffalo, you know, and then Chester, New Hampshire, well, Vermont, whatever she didn't mention. But well, I didn't see all these places. And she said, and then I got a call to move to the United States. So that was flying around an airplane, looking down and seeing those same places, and it was exactly the same as her dreams. But she said in the dream she was an eagle, and she was seen through the eyes of the eagle, you know. She says, now I go direct, because, oh, it's the same story. <laughs> so, so part of the, part of what happens when I think, when people are visited by birds and there's something miraculous, I believe that our ancestors here, you know, our native ancestors had those abilities. I know my grandfather had that ability. And I'll tell you a story that proves it, okay? But then in the terms of the cards, it's similar in that they're guiding, your ancestors may be guiding your hands. So the room may be full of ancestors. Yeah. And tomorrow, remind me, I want to talk about the natural spiritual world, the world that we look outside the window, we say, oh, that's nature, but that's not what it is. It's actually a spiritual realm. But I'll tell you the story of my grandfather as I was 13 or so. And I was walking along Old Orchard Beach. Anybody ever heard of Old Orchard Beach? Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, our family had really built and founded Old Orchard Beach. And uh, they're all, you know, call it closet micmacs. And um, so I was walking along the beach at 13, and there was this same particular spot. Every time I went there, something kind of magical would happen. But, you know, mm. kind of nice, something nice would happen. It would be some special shell or feather or something. I was 13 years old. I didn't know anything. So walking along the edge of the water, and I get to the certain spot, and this seagull comes flying down and drops a huge fish right at my feet. Never seen anything like it before then. So obviously I pick up the fish, and I'm holding this big fish, and it's like slopping around and trying to get, you know, somewhere and just wiggling. And I thought, okay, thank you. And I thought, well, I'm not really hungry. I'm not hungry. I don't want this fish. So I want the fish to live, so I picked up the fish in my hands and swung it and flung it into the ocean and it flew away. It, it swam away. Never saw it again. And I always wondered what that crazy event meant. I couldn't figure it out. That was back in the old days when I was 13. We were talking about the 60s, right? Okay. So just a few years ago, about four years ago, 
I was collecting stories on birds and weird things that birds did, and now it's bird medicine. And so I'm thinking, well, there's only one person left. You know, you didn't tell me anybody. I had the one person I haven't interviewed, and that was my aunt. Okay. And so I went to Aunt Kay, we sat down at the kitchen table, and I'm asking all these questions about all kinds of things. I said, oh, by the way, I'll tell you this funny story. And I told this story of the seagull. She the says, seagull. Where, the seagull dropped the fish at my oh, feet. Oh, I thought you said an eagle. A seagull. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, that would really be strange. But. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that white owl came to the beach, by the way, you know, in that other story? You get that? The blind woman is at the beach. And the owl's on the beach. It's the totally on the a white owl on the beach. I mean, mm. crazy. So I'm there, and the seagull comes <clears throat> and drops the fish at my feet. I told her the story. She said, exactly where was that? I said, it was at the foot of this street. If you take the street and you go down, 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 and over the railroad tracks and down across the street and then the front street and then all down the beach and right down to the edge of the ocean. And that's where the seagull dropped this fish. And she said, well, that's the darn thing I ever heard, you know, that's, yeah, I do know why that happened, but I don't want to talk about it. So tell me, tell me, tell me, you know. <laughs> oh, well, I don't like to talk about that Indian stuff, because you never know who might be listening, but, but your grandpa actually, well, I never told you this, but, I mean, this was four years ago. I'm an old man, and she's lucky to be alive, you know, <laughs> at her age. And I said, what? She said, yeah, your grandpa, you he practiced ceremony and shamanism and all that stuff. I wasn't going to tell you, you know. Oh, yeah. I said, but I, mm. you knew I was interested. I said, well, I figured I'd get around to it sooner or later. Mm -hmm. I said, well, what are you saying? What is it about this? What does that have to do with the seagull and the fish? He said, well, that was his praying spot, you know, at dawn. He would go down the road, go right down to the edge of the beach, <clears throat> and when the sun would come up over the horizon, you've heard the story, the, the, there'd be a red road along the waves. That's the red road. And that red light would come right up to the beach and hit the land at a certain spot. And, you know, we have a lot of beliefs about that power of that red water, you know. And he would get out some tobacco, and he would offer tobacco right at the edge of the water at dawn for you and for all the younger people in our family who are coming up that you would live long enough to pass along these teachings, you know. Mm. And I wanted to say, yeah, well, you didn't help, you know. <laughs> but, you know, she was wonderful, wonderful aunt still around. And she turned out to be the one to finally answer the question that I had had for 40-some years. Okay, easy, wow. 40 years. That I always wondered why the seagull dropped the fish. Oh, you didn't and, ask her at that time, then? Well, sure not. <laughs> not then. Oh. No, because she was like, oh, no, we don't, we don't talk. Oh, you're not. Well, you don't. You know, who knows? Maybe we're, in, we're not, you know, but coming to my church, whatever. So she was a beautiful, <laughs> fantastic woman. She taught me a lot. And she really understood. She was teaching me ways through non-labeling, yes. which is our way, too. And we don't name anything. It's like, you know, it is what you know is what you know. So that's how she taught me. And so when I got to that point, she said, yeah, that was your grandfather flying around in that seagull. Nurturing you. And nurturing you and showing you, like, you know, giving you food, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I took the name Seagull after that. Oh. <clears throat> but then, you know, Grandfather Turtle said, no, no, that's not. That's not right. That's not right. So I became Chima. But anyway, so she finally, after 40 years, answered the question. She said, that was where you're, that same spot where your grandfather would pray, put down tobacco for you and for the other young people in the family that you would be strong. And he was nurturing you, and there's just you know no question. So that brings up another true story that was actually in the papers uh, somewhere hundreds of years ago, but that his grandfather and his father and mother were living at a different place nearby. And so that his father had been up in this territory somewhere, up in way up in actually Maine, further up. And he was caught in a blizzard, and he usually knew all these tricks, but nothing was working. So he was, looked like he was going to die in the blizzard, because it was 30 below, and, you know, he forgot his coat or something, you know, how it was hunting. So he ran into some Passamaquoddies, and they helped him, and so come and stay with us, you know. So we stayed for a few days until the blizzard blew over, and then he went back to his wife and family. And before he left, he said, oh, by the way, Thanks for everything. And if you're ever in my neck of the woods, just drop by and go by, you know, thinking, well, this is done. So he travels, and this is a long time ago. 
before cars. And, and so he's back, and he's in his little house there, which I know where it is. It's on the, oh, Scarborough Road. Anyway, so his wife is there in the kitchen one day. You know, so it was, let me correct that. She's coming home from work into the kitchen, and there in the kitchen is 29 oh, <laughs> fully dressed oh, Fast McQuarrie's in full regalia, right? Oh. And they're in her kitchen. She says, hello, <laughs> excuse me. I said, hi. And she said, uh, <clears throat> can I help you? Oh, no, we don't need any help from you. Uh, well, this is my kitchen. Are you hungry? Oh, no, we don't want your food, you know. He said, well, why are you here? And they said, well, what do you mean, why were you here? I mean, do you know what day it is, lady? And they said, well, it's June 20th, yeah. That's right, June 20th. Do you know what tomorrow is then? Yeah, it's June 21st. You know what that is? Yeah, it's summer solstice. Yeah, why? He says, well, you know, that's a sacred day, you know. He says, yeah, I know. He says, well, you know what? Dawn, that water is going to... You know, come waving in, and the sun's going to rise up on the horizon, and it's going to leave this red road across the waves. And at a certain point, it's going to hit the land, and that water is going to be sacred water, this healing water. And if we swim, if we're able to swim in that water, we're going to be healed, and we won't get sick the rest of the year. And you wouldn't want us to get sick, would you? <laughs> well, she was like, okay, all right, never mind. Yes, you can stay. So then her husband came home, and she had a few words for him. Because <laughs> he forgot to mention the thing about any time, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the 20, 28, 29 past McCoy's. And so they all went to bed. The next morning, she came down as early as she could, and they were all gone, and there was not a trace of anyone had ever been there. And so they all ran down to the beach to try to catch them bathing and there was they'd already left you know and uh, and yet that was in the it ended up in the papers that they talked about that and about this tradition had gone on for hundreds of years so the passable quality would go to this very spot every year to bathe you know in their waters oh. and uh, that you know he had almost witnessed that but were they still doing it or not? I'm not so sure. But that was a Pastor McCoy story. So that's how he became aware of that spot. And he told his son, who then was my grandfather, who made the offering, and then the seagull came, you see. And so that brings us to today. Okay. So we're the people like my grandfather. So you are all, you know, continuing those stories. And we drum up the sun in the morning. We put tobacco down. Sunrise, there's three sacred times of the day. Sunrise, noon, apparent noon, that is, and sunset. And these are the times of gathering because you can always tell somebody without a watch when to meet. Oh, meet me at sunrise, meet me at midday, meet me at sunset. You don't need a watch.